shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.
Hi everyone, I'm so glad that you decided to join us for our first online student service. Uh, in the midst of all this chaos and everything that's going on, I'm so glad that you still took time out of your day to join us in worship, even though we can't be all here together uh, in this building physically, but that we're all here learning about the same God and worshiping the same God through this time of uncertainty and just everything that we have going on. Um, a few weeks ago when Zach asked me to speak on this series called Second Glances, he asked me um, what Bible story I would be doing uh, in this series, and I immediately said Moses in the burning bush, um, and he kind of kind of took him back. He kind of got a little shocked at first because he wasn't expecting that, and I kind of wasn't expecting it either. Um, but I decided that God had a plan for that, and that He wanted to show something to me uh, through this story and taking a second glance at it. Um, and just learning about it. So today, if you have your Bibles and maybe something to write on, um, I'm going to give you some points that you should probably write down because we are going to be using, studying this in our Zoom family groups um, that we do later on today. So um, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 3, um, and I'm just going to start in verse 1 and kind of read through uh, this point. Up until this point, Moses, if you know anything about Moses, he was born, and um, Pharaoh had a decree that uh, to kill every little boy, uh, and his mother wanted to spare him. So he, she, she decided to send him down the river um, to spare his life. Pharaoh's daughter ends up finding Moses um, and pulls him out and decides to take him on as her own child. So um, I'm going to go ahead and start in verse 3, or sorry, chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now go turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of a bush and said, Moses, Moses, he said, here I am. Then he said, Do not draw near to this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, and the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, so I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up to a land flowing of milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Haviites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Now come therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt." But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. So um, at this point, Moses is having this face-to-face -face encounter with God. God is speaking to Moses um, through the burning bush, and he's calling him to something greater than what Moses has experienced so far. So far, Moses has um, fled from where he was currently at because he murdered a man. And in your Zoom family groups, you're going to be talking about that, and you're going to be reading that, um, the first two chapters of Exodus, because it talks about all that and gives you all the details. But um, Moses is fleeing from a place because of something wrong that he's done. Um, and God decides to stop him where he is and... Um, call him to something greater. Um, and I think that this is a story that um, was talked about when I was in Sunday school. It was like kind of discussed because it was an essential part of Moses' life, but it wasn't really addressed in like 
a deep, let's dive into this and see um, what God has for us. Um, and I think that it's really cool that I've gotten a chance to study this so that I can uh, tell you guys like what God has on my heart and what he has shown me through this story. Um, and I have a few points for you that we're going to go over. Um, but I think that this, whenever I you know, went back and read this story, um, not everyone really pays attention to this part of Moses' life. Moses' life is so, like, compact with so many different things. I mean, he parted the Red Sea. He led the Israelites out of Egypt. He, um, you know, talks about the plagues. It talks about Pharaoh and uh, just all these different things that Moses had going on in his life, the Ten Commandments, like, all these different things. And then the story of the burning bush, it's not recognized as one of, like, the great things that Moses had going on in his life. Um, but I think that this is, like, a true like pivotal point in his life that really turned things around for him because God is calling him to something that he doesn't think that he could do. Um, immediately in verse 11 and 14, 11 through 14, Moses is struggling with this doubt and he, you know, he understands the calling that God has for him, but he immediately, I mean, in verse 10, God gives him instructions. He says, come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people out of, of Israel, out of Egypt. In verse 11, Moses is immediately asking God, who am I to do this? Why are you calling me to do this? I'm not somebody that normally would do this. Um, and so I have three points that I really want to talk about because I think that a lot of times in our lives, we'll run into a point where we feel like God is telling us to do something. A lot of people, when they hear the word calling, they think that that's strictly a calling to ministry or they like calling to be a missionary or something super crazy like that. Um, that's not always necessarily true. God can call you to do many different things in your life. He can call you to be friends with that person that doesn't have anyone to sit with at the lunch table or to get out of a relationship that you know you shouldn't be in or just different things like that. He has smaller, I guess he can call you to do smaller things than just huge general topics like ministry or something like that because not everyone is called to ministry. Not everyone is meant to be a minister. Um, but he has these certain callings on your life that we should be obedient um, to no matter how big or small they are. Um, and so for my first point, I want to talk about, it's called God is for us, Satan is against us. And this is pretty uh, foundational in Christianity. Like it's kind of obvious that we should believe this uh, because we do believe in our Savior and we do believe that he uh, sent his son to die for us because of sin and because of all the hatred in the world. But um, a lot of times we don't live out our lives with this kind of mindset, with this kind of thinking of like, God has my best interests um, for me. Like he has the best will for my life and I should be obedient to that. Um, Moses immediately whenever he is doubting God and he's doubting what God has called him to do, I can only imagine, I mean, it doesn't say in these verses what, he was, what was going through his head, but Moses literally just killed a man. Um, so you can imagine the guilt that he carried with him along with that. Um, Moses was a murderer. So what I'm trying to get at is God wants to take those kinds of situations. God wants to take those mistakes and those mess-ups, and he wants to give glory to him. He wants you to use those in your testimony to reach other people and to give glory to him. He didn't want Moses to carry around that guilt of killing that man. Um, Satan wanted to use that as a way to keep Moses from being obedient to what God was telling him to do. Uh, that's why our first instinct whenever God calls us to do something is, you know, why me? Like, I've done this and this and this. You know, why ask me to do something like this? Um, because Satan wants to take every situation that we've ever been in and use it against us. He doesn't want to use it to help us be obedient to what God has to say. God wants to take every situation, good or bad, and use it for his good um, and his glory. Uh, and that kind of has to, you really have to think about that in a sense of changing your mindset about the way that you feel about your past. Um, you have to change your mindset in the way that you like think about who God is. Um, you have to realize that God is the perfecter of all things. Um, so, for us to truly believe that, we can't carry our past mistakes with us and then press for what he has in our lives. We can't carry both of those things. Um, so that leads me into my next point. Um, as Christians and as Christ followers, we have to stop thinking that God doesn't know what he's talking about when he calls us to do these things. 
uh, it was almost like Moses in verse 11, it was almost like he was asking God, like, do you know who I am? Like, do you know what I've done? I mean, in just the previous chapter, he had made all these mistakes. And he asked God, he was like, you know, do you even realize, like, who you're calling to do this crazy thing? And um, he, it's almost like Moses had to, like, he forgot who God is and who he truly is, that he is the perfecter of all things, and that he wants your brokenness, he wants your mistakes to use them for his glory. Um, We have to start, we have to stop thinking and getting in our own head and saying, like, oh, you know, God doesn't want this because it's too messy, or God doesn't want this because it, it wasn't something that glorified him at the moment. Um, but God can take any situation with his timing and his perfection. He can take anything and use it for his glory. We can't just assume because we've messed up and it, you know, we maybe fell off the path for a while that God wants nothing to do with us anymore, and that's not true at all. Um, we have to start believing that he is in control of every situation in our life, Um, that he's in control of every mistake. He's in control of every good part of our life. Like he has control over everything. He created everything. We have to understand that um, he doesn't want us to stray away from that kind of thinking of that God is in control. He wants us to really embrace that and live that out through our lives. Um, But it's not just about us not being obedient. I mean, we have to really understand, like, that even in these times of chaos and these times of uncertainty with what we're going on, uh, just in our country and in our world today with, like, things like the coronavirus and different things like that, um, we have to understand that he is in control of that. Um, A lot of people are scared. A lot of people are hurting, and a lot of people are very anxious about what's going on. But we just have to understand that he wasn't surprised about any of this. I know, like, people have said that a lot. But he wasn't. I mean, he knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew how we were going to um, react to it. And he is in control of all of it. And so we have to have that mindset of, you know what, I don't know what tomorrow holds. And I don't know if, you know, we're going to even be around to see any of this happen. But I know that God is in control and that he has us and that he's, you know, if it's for his glory, that's what should be done. Um, and that moves me into my next point of life is too short to not have an eternal mindset. Um, Moses, whenever he was doubting God, whenever he was doubting, um, you know, do you really want me to do this? Like, is this something that I'm really called to? He wasn't thinking, he wasn't thinking with an eternal mindset. Uh, what that means is, I'm going to go ahead and read Philippians. It's chapter 3, um, 13 through 15. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things that are ahead. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mindset, and if any, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. This, what Paul writes in Philippians, this is the kind of eternal mindset that we're called to have as Christ followers. Um, it shouldn't matter if God is telling us to talk to that person that's not a Christ follower, or if he's telling us to get out of that relationship that we're in, if he's telling us to maybe find some new friends because the ones that we have aren't good for us, it shouldn't matter what our earthly consequences are. Um, Someone with an eternal mindset doesn't consider the earthly consequences as real consequences. Um, And that's really hard to think about, and you know, you're not going to be perfect, you're not going to be super good at it. Uh, I know it's something that I still struggle with, but I just think of it this way. There are so many people today in today's world that are, have a fear of dying. They have like an irrational fear of dying in pain or like dying to some crazy extent or, or degree, and that sounds super dark, but they have a fear of dying. As Christ followers, it, our fear should not be of dying. Our fear should be dying and meeting our maker and standing in front of our savior and him not being able to say well done good and faithful servant uh for me as a Christ follower that is my worst fear that is like something that I wrestle with a lot at night of like am I doing enough uh to serve him am I having that kind of eternal mindset that I should have um because you know your life your walk with God doesn't end whenever you become a Christian 
and it took me a long time to figure that out. Um, I was 13 when I got saved, so I was pretty young uh, compared to some people, but I, um, it, it took me a while to realize that my walk with Christ isn't just about being a Christian and going to heaven. Uh, that's an undeserved reward that we get and that we receive and that, yeah, it can't be taken away from us. But from that point on, it's our job. It's our calling. It's everyone's calling. Uh, no matter what you're called to in your life, it's everyone's calling to serve him and to have that kind of mindset of, you know, I don't care what my earthly consequences are for doing this. If it means serving God and it means laying my life down and him being in total control of my life, then that's what I have to do. Moses had to go in front of Pharaoh, who literally wanted him dead. Uh, it was Pharaoh's decree to, to kill him in the first place. Um, so, you know, it's, Moses didn't think about those kind of earthly consequences. He had a little bit of doubt at first, but he still followed through with it. If you go on to read the rest of Exodus, he still follows through with it. He gets the Israelites out of Egypt, um, but he's obedient in that. He doesn't care about that, yeah, I might die from this, but if it means serving God to the fullest extent that I can, then I'm going to be willing to do whatever it takes. Um, and that's something that we should really reflect on and really um, evaluate in our lives. Like, uh, are we prepared to do something like that? Are we prepared to, especially in this time of chaos and craziness, like in our world, are we prepared to give up everything to serve him and do what he's called us to do? Um, when I was reading through the life of Moses... I went back, uh, and you'll read this when you go back with your Zoom groups and your family groups, and you'll talk about this, but um, in verse 10 in chapter 2, it's talking about when Moses was first born, and it talks about when Pharaoh's daughter pulled him out of the water, uh, and it says, and this is how Moses got his name, and I originally didn't know this until I went back and was studying and reading this, and I thought that it was super cool. Um, in verse 10, it says, and the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he, came, he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, because I drew him out of the water. For some of you, you can't fulfill the purpose that God has for you. You can't fulfill the calling that he has for you because you don't even have that relationship with him. Um, and that's something that, uh, you know, if you're interested in doing something like that, if you just get a hold of somebody, you can get a hold of your small group leaders, or you can get a hold of Zach, you can text somebody on their mind. If you just make the effort to just get in touch with somebody about that, we would be more than happy to talk to you. No matter what that looks like, if we have to come to your house or talk to you on the phone, like whatever that may look like. Uh, but some of you, God is just calling you to be drawn out of the water. He's just calling you to be his, um, to be his child. And that's something that uh, if you have questions about, like I said, anyone would love to talk to you about that. Um, but the goal here is obedience. Um, in this time of isolation, the, enemy, the best thing for the enemy would be to attack you. He's a coward in the sense that he wants to attack people when they're by themselves, when they um, don't have their biggest defense around them. Um, he wants you to be focused on uh, you not being able to see your friends or all the bad things, all the negative things going on, and he wants you to feel bad about yourself, essentially. Um, he wants to create anxiety. He wants to create fear among people. But if we just focus on what God has for us and be obedient to his plan and his purpose throughout all of this and throughout our lives um, after all of this is over with, um, then that is when the enemy doesn't stand a chance. When we are obedient to what God has for us and we focus on his word and his promise that, um, you know, he, works, he makes all things work together um, for our good and his glory. Um, and that's what we should focus on during this time. So I'm going to go ahead and pray for us. Um, and then I have some things to tell you after that. So. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you that we are able to come together, even if it's over computers and different things like that, God. Uh, I thank you that we have the technology to be able to do something like that. Um, and I just pray that you will be with each and every one of these students or anybody that watches this, God, um, that you will just help them be obedient to what you would have to say. I pray that they would just lean into you and really focus on what you have for them. Um, and I pray that they would just spend this extra time that they have to themselves, uh, just focus on you and just learning more about you and just um, going deeper into the word and what you would have to say to them, God. I pray that if some of them have not made that commitment to have a relationship with you, 
uh, that they would just realize that and then they would talk to somebody, reach out to somebody and um, just begin to start that relationship just to grow deeper and know about you. Um, I thank you for all that you do. And I pray, amen. Okay, guys, now it's time to move into our Zoom family groups. If you haven't signed up for these yet, then you need to send a message through our Remind with your name, grade, and phone number. This way we can get them to the leaders and they can invite you to the chat. If you're not signed up for our Remind, then you need to text at LBBCS to 81010. We'll see you in just a little bit for our Zoom family groups, and we'll see you next week, same night, same time.